Okay, good morning. Let's get started. Um, so we are recording now. Yeah. Um, so I hope everyone had a good holiday break. Um, so this is the last week of classes. So we'll have this lecture and lecture on Wednesday. Um, at the end of today's lecture, please remind me, I will give some feedback uh, on project two overall, and then also discuss sort of end of the course logistics um, in terms of also you know, how homeworks will be graded that you know, have not been graded um, because of the, the strike. Um, so we'll, we'll discuss that. Um, so before we begin, any general questions about the course material or the course before we start? Yes. Should the project one range? Oh, they're not posted yet? Oh, you can't see them? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Professor McVeigh posted those. So let me just, maybe we need to make sure those are posted. Maybe I won't do that now because I'm going to depress some of you <laughs> before the class. So, uh, so let me post them <laughs> at the end. Uh, but let me just see why they're not available. Uh, let's see. Sorry, the TAs usually do this, so I apologize if. Okay, I, I see it's still unpublished. Okay. Um, so yeah, let me publish that. Oops, what happened to the grades there? Okay, I think I see where it is. Maybe where is that? All right, well, let me let's spend some time at the end of the class discussing that. Um, oh, okay, I see. Yeah, so I, I see it's not it's not available to see. Okay, uh, when I see homework four is also not available to see either. Okay, so yeah, so there's a lot of uh, because of this current situation, there there's a lot of logistics we'll have to talk about at the end of the, the course the lecture today. Uh, anything else before we get started? Okay, so um, today we're going to recap a little bit about uh, image contrast. Uh, finish our discussion of functional MRI, um, and then sort of get into sort of uh, moving from sort of a classical sort of MRI to sort of giving you at least a sort of an overview of where things are going. And so that uh, for those of you who want to sort of be in this field or essentially anything imaging related, sort of just give you sort of a, a roadmap to sort of what things you might want to sort of keep your eye on and, and learn about uh, in either future classes or, or in your research or, or in other, in your work. So just to remind you, uh, we spent quite a bit of time last uh, lecture talking about T1 weighted, T2 weighted, proton density weighted. There was one question on the um, pre-lecture quiz that was the one that gave, seemed to give most, most people did it very well on the pre-lecture quiz, that's really good. Um, but there was one question that was sort of um, worth talking about. So remember when if we have two tissues, T1 and T2, uh, they recover at different rates. Now, let's say we took this tissue and had it recover at a slightly slower rate, right? Right. So that would tend to, if we took the difference between the blue and the red, that would tend to shift the curve over here, right? So it would make the difference move out, this maximum difference. And so if we increase the T1 of one tissue, then we would expect to, to sort of keep, to maximize the contrast we would want to increase the TR, all right? And so most people got that. Now there was a question about whether TE should go up or should go down, okay? Remember for T1 contrast in general, you want to get rid of any T dependence. So given no other information, you would want to make TE go down, right? Because for whatever reason, let's say that the, the T2s became very short and you made the TE increase, you could get rid of all your signal. So for that problem, you sort of, um, given the best information you have, you would want to increase the TR. And if you had to do something DE, you would always want to minimize it for a T1 weighted sequence. Uh, for T2 weighted, remember that um, you want to make TR very long, right? And then the question was, do you want to make TE long or short? And so that was sort of ambiguous, but in general, if you make T too short, then this term is going to go to zero, or it's going to go to one. So there's not going to be any T2 contrast. 
So given a choice between long or short TEs, you would have to pick a longer TE as opposed to a shorter TE. And remember inversion recovery, uh, most people got this, but there was some, a few people who sort of uh, picked some other options, which is basically, remember we're nulling things based on their T1. Okay, so with this T1 recovery, we're picking this inversion time such that if we wanna get rid of like CSF, we wait this amount of time. And so as a T1 recovers at this point, the magnetization is going through zero. And so if we excite at that time, we don't get anything from that tissue. So remember that's a T1 uh, effect. Um, and just to remind you uh, about um, functional MRI. Uh, so first of all, any questions about those image contrast questions? So now we're gonna get uh, sort of do functional MRI, just review the basic mechanisms and then give you some idea of the applications, um, just mo mostly for your knowledge. So remember the whole basis of fMRI, the fundamental basis of it is that um, the, real, the, the effective relaxation rate R2 star depends on deoxyhemoglobin. So these iron atoms, the more there are, the more they can perturb the field and cause the spins to phase more quickly. So if there's not many iron atoms, then there's gonna be some amount of dephasing. So some deoxyhemoglobin, some dephasing. And um, the more deoxyhemoglobin there is, they're more dephasing. And so that's a higher R2 star. Remember R2 star is the rate of decay. So the more things dephase, the higher R2 star will be. Okay, so that's the fundamental picture of what's going on with fMRI. Now it turns out that for the vast majority of functional activations, we're actually going from this state here to this state here, okay? So we start off with some deoxyhemoglobin and then very quickly the brain says, I better deliver more oxygen. So it's gonna to go to a state with less deoxyhemoglobin. And therefore there's gonna be less deoxyhemoglobin, less dephasing, R2 star is gonna go down and the MRI signal therefore go up. Okay, because there's less decay. So that's sort of summarized in this picture here where remember we have the red representing oxy and the blue representing deoxy. Uh, with some neural activity, there might be some increase in metabolism and therefore there might be an initial increase in deoxyhemoglobin before the brain's been able to sort of turn on the, the oxygen supply. And so with very careful experiments, you can see this, but it's not easy to see. By far the biggest effect occurs when the brain sort of says, well, I better deliver more oxygen um, because, um, and it's actually a good, if you think about how you'd wanna design a brain, this actually makes a lot of sense, right? If I'm in the jungle and I see like, there might be something moving in the jungle, like a tiger, uh, and I don't know what I need to do next, I better make sure I have a lot of oxygen on hand because I might have to do a lot of processing and move and run and, and do make a lot of decisions very quickly. I don't want to be cheap here and say, well, you don't need that much oxygen. Okay. So from an evolutionary point of view, whoever, all the people, all the sort of animals who did this, which is most animals alive now do this. Okay. So this, this ratio tends to be even to animals two to one, three to one, um, because it, especially it's higher, it tends to be higher, like, especially in your visual cortex and your motor cortex, because uh, those areas um, tend to, you don't want to um, sort of uh, skimp on, on making sure those areas can act very quickly. Okay. So therefore then uh, that leads to less deoxyhemoglobin and therefore increase in the positive bold signal. And then um, a decrease, post-stimulus uh, decrease. Okay. Okay. So uh, the remainder of the functional MRI, so any questions on the basics of how the fMRI mechanism works? Obviously it's a very basic uh, explanation of it. It's a, it's a much deeper area, but that's a basic explanation. Okay. So um, what we're gonna do now is just sort of give you a feel for what sort of this, the applications are. So uh, this was obviously, um, you know, Homer Simpson's view of what the brain does. and. Uh, I think when I made this slide, I was just curious as to how many of these uh, functions had actually been studied with fMRI. And so pretty much everything that was listed in this thing could be studied 
Uh, the only thing I couldn't really find, if you like search on donuts in fMRI, you can't really find anything. But certainly there's been a lot of work on like imaging obesity and, and food and things like that. So, you know, even here at F, uh, UCSD, there's a big group that looks at eating disorders and, and uses fMRI to study the brain and how it, how it is affected with say anorexia or bulimia. Uh, one of, it's, a, it's not a recent study, but one of my favorite studies is this study out of Caltech uh, in this area that's called sort of neuroeconomics, which is sort of like studying how the brain makes economic decisions. So the task here was um, basically they were given wine. Um, and so they were given the same wine um, in sort of like a paper cup or whatever. So it wasn't labeled. And in some cases they were told the wine cost $90, and in the other cases, they were told the wine cost $10. On another set of experiments, they were told that it costs $45, or we told that it costs $5. So this is exactly the same wine that they're tasting, but they're just told it costs a different amount. And so this is how much they like it. So basically, if you're told that the wine you're drinking costs $90, you like it a lot. And if you're told that it only costs $10, you don't really like it as much, even though it's exactly the same wine. Okay, um, so same thing here, 45 to five. And so, um, and if you're told, not told the price, then the liking doesn't really vary very much. So the price actually signals to your brain a lot about, you know, what the value of the wine is, okay? So this is why, you know, uh, and obviously the stores know this, and so that's why they can charge you, you know, $4,000 for a, a Louis Vuitton bag or something like that, but it costs a hundred dollars to make or something. Okay. So uh, just be aware of this. This is basically um, your brain responding to uh, pricing. And so this is the experiment they did. And so for example here, and basically there, these highlighted areas are sort of areas of the brain know to respond to reward. And so uh, in this case, if you're told that the wine, uh, Cost forty-five dollars, then your brain, the reward area, sort of lights up pretty well. And on the other hand, if you're told that it costs five dollars, it doesn't really light up so much. And then here, there's like even this negative response, which uh, I don't remember exactly their interpretation, but it's certainly not as strong as this response. And here, if you make it ninety to ten dollars, um, notice it's the same ratio, nine to one, but ninety just seems a lot bigger than forty-five, right? So um, here you get a really big response. I mean, you really like that $90 wine. Whereas when you have the $10 wine from say Trader Joe's, right? You're like, eh, you know, maybe not so, so important or not so satisfying, okay? Uh, so anyways, this is sort of a cute study where they use fMRI to actually see that the, the, really the brain is actually responding quite differently. It's not just some, um, and then there was actually specific areas of the brain that are causing you to make that decision. Okay, or, or reflective of your decision making. Uh, a sort of a cool thing is mind reading. I mean, this this is something that people want to always ask: is like, can you actually use fMRI to sort of see what someone's thinking or dreaming? Uh, this is some work done out of um, uh, Berkeley, uh, Jack Balance Group. And so here, what you're going to see in this video is you're going to see the movie, and then there, this is the prediction of what's being seen in the movie. It's not gonna be that great, but it's it's sort of not just by chance. So just let's look at that. Um, so anyways, that slide is on YouTube, so you can watch the rest of it, but you can sort of see it does a reasonable job, you know, I mean, at least you could tell that in some cases there are things moving. Uh, does anyone know who this guy is? Who? Yeah, what's his name? Yeah, see, this is, yeah, like, if I asked this question 20 years ago, more people would <laughs> That's Steve Martin. He's like one of the most famous comedians of the 20th century, but now we're in the 21st century. Okay. Um, and these are just some pictures of what was seen and sort of what the decoding would be. So it's not perfect, uh, but people are still working on to sort of make this better. Essentially, the idea is that your brain 
has uh, different areas of the brain respond differently to different shapes, and edges, and, and visual features. And so uh, the idea is, can you use that to sort of decode? This actually does, this is actually pretty good, right? I mean, this is a stained glass window, and actually does a pretty good job there. Uh, so that's one sort of application that um, whether or not it actually ever takes off, it, it's still TBD, but it is an area of research. Another area of research that's sort of cool, although still not really happened, taken off is real-time fMRI. Uh, the idea here is um, like uh, if you are, um, like if I told everyone now to sort of decrease the blood oxygenation in your parietal cortex, most of you would just like go what? You know, how would I do that? But it turns out if I showed you the fMRI signal in your, this region, I forget which region this is, but um, maybe it's the anterior cingulate cortex, but basically just by showing the person the signal and saying, make it go up or make it go down, you can actually learn to modulate your brain regions, okay? And so here uh, they're basically told in the blue areas, they're told to, when you see the blue thing, try to make the signal in that area of your, this area of your brain go down. And it turns out people can actually learn to do that. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Is it safe to do that? Um, you know, it's a good question. It, it's probably okay. I mean, you do this all the time anyways, whenever you think about something sad or happy, you're actually doing this to yourself all the time. <laughs> uh, so it's probably no worse than that. And, and if the, I mean, the reason this hasn't really taken off is the effects don't are not that strong. And so, you know, because you, you learn, you might learn it, you may be trained for, you know, a few hours, but then you don't have anything to reinforce it in your everyday life. If now, if like Elon Musk or whatever gets his dream and has the electrodes implanted in your brain all the time, then yeah, you could probably, we could probably do this. Okay. Um, so by far the most common fMRI is what's called task-related fMRI, where we actually give the person a task. And so in this case, they're just opening or closing their eyes and we can measure the activity in their visual cortex here. Okay. But there's another very um, powerful and actually quite widely used um, area of fMRI called resting state fMRI. Uh, and in this one, we basically just take a movie of someone's brain while they're just lying in the scanner, uh, either with their eyes open or closed, but really they're just not doing anything, but obviously, you're always doing something, right? Your brain's always doing something. And so it turns out your brain is actually moving and, and, and active and dynamic all the time. Now, if you look at any one area of the brain, it's what you see looks sort of noisy. And it's really hard to say whether this is uh, really anything going on. But it turns out that if you, so for example, this is, these red areas are showing what areas of the brain light up in response to someone tapping their fingers, okay? So this is your primary motor cortex, lighting up. These maps here, which look very similar to these maps, are actually obtained in a totally different manner. They're from someone who's just lying in the scanner. And so we take the signal, say the green signal, from their left motor cortex. And we take that signal and we correlate it with every other signal in the brain. And so that correlation map then is just saying, how much of the brain looks like this area of the brain in the resting state? And we end up with a resting state a map here which looks very much like um, what was happening during activity. So for example, the blue here is the, um, the signal that's going on in your right motor cortex. So even when you're just resting, like right now, your left and right motor cortices are, are pretty much in sync, okay? Um, so it turns out that this is a really powerful way of like sort of mapping the functional networks in your brain. Um, and also even looking at the effects of drugs. This is a acute study one of our, our students did where this is the correlation map um, at rest. And then uh, when the student gave the person caffeine, it got rid of these activation maps, okay? So it turned out that um, caffeine can have a pretty big effect on, on obviously on how the brain works and this is one, one effect that they saw. It also decreases your blood flow by quite a bit. So this is the blood flow before caffeine and after caffeine. Um, so, uh, since the discovery of resting state networks, uh, there's been quite a lot of networks. Uh, one very popular network is the default mode network. Um, this is the network that sort of is active when you're sort of thinking about yourself and then less active when you're sort of doing a task. 
Um, and so there's been, you know, quite a few networks discovered, but there's typically about 20 or 30 networks that are typically discussed uh, a lot. Um, and another sort of cool thing is that um, it turns out that if you, we just put you in the scanner, so let's say this person was in, you know, we had like a hundred time points. So that's maybe a hundred seconds of data. Um, so basically a minute of data, we just put you in the scanner for a minute and we just measured your resting state networks. This is showing how well we can predict who's who just by looking at that data. So if I put all of you in the room, scan your, scan your brains in the resting state, and then look at the pattern and try to figure out who's who, uh, with just like a minute of data, there's almost 100% accuracy. Because so you, each of your brains has this sort of um, fingerprint of, of how, it, how it behaves, uh, even in the resting state. So essentially, um, our brains are unique enough that we, we can tell people apart. Okay. So there's been a lot of work done in fMRI. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of papers, so we're just, we can just touch upon it, but uh, certainly that's, that's um, so all I wanted to do today was just sort of review the basic contrast mechanisms and give you some sense of some applications, okay? So before we switch gears, any questions? Okay. So now we're gonna sort of switch gears quite a bit and talk a little bit about, essentially get you up to speed, okay? So what we mostly talked about, we talked a lot about case space. This is sort of like 40-year-old um, technology that you've been learning, okay? But it's, it's, we have to start there, okay? I mean, even if the Fourier transform is you know, over 100 years old, but at least we still learn it, right? And so, um, and, but you can sort of see over the last 40 years, there's been a lot of improvements. And we're sort of gonna just give you an overview of this. So you have a sense of it if you got in the world and you're in this area, either an MRI, but it, essentially any imaging, uh, similar types of uh, um, progress is, is, is being made in all types of imaging, whether it be CT or uh, PET or anything like that. But in MRI specifically, um, in the 80s was when the MRI really took off in terms of clinical application. In 1990, Paul, um, was it Paul? Peter Romer, I believe, from GE came up with the idea of you know, instead of just one coil, why don't we use multiple coils? And what can we do with that? And so we'll talk a little bit about something he came up with, which is called sum of squares. But this sort of lingered for almost a decade until a few, I think Dan and Carl, we were all graduate students when they came up with it, or Klaus, and he probably, Marcus, probably a postdoc. So the next innovation was actually made by a bunch of very young scientists, um, 1997, 1999, 2002. And this basically revolutionized MRI. This was the next step. This, if you want to think about, this is like the modern phase of MRI. And this still affects today, 20 years later. And this was, how do we use these multiple coils to actually make imaging go faster? Okay, so that was really innovation. So uh, in, the, in basically in the 2000s is when you saw the manufacturer start making machines with multiple channels. Okay, before that, it was really only one channel. But now, for example, you know, the machine we have, we might have 128 channels, okay? So this was really the, um, the impetus behind that because all of a sudden the manufacturers could make an argument for, you know, having to buy more channels because it allowed you to go faster. So, but this was still sort of based in 48, um, you know, concepts. And so the next sort of phase happened with another graduate student, this is Nikki Luxtig, who was at Stanford at the time, now professor at Berkeley, who took some work being done in the statistics uh, literature, some colleagues at Stanford in statistics, and introduced something called compressed sensing. Okay. And so this is 2007. This is this is in the clinic, but it's probably less used. And this is all this is all under parallel imaging, which we'll talk about. Compressed sensing is there, although it's less used in parallel imaging. But this was sort of the first um, step at saying. Um, what if we just collect less data and also take advantage of some of the, what we know about images, okay? So introducing some prior information to help us constrain our reconstruction. So this is an area, they called it sparse MRI. Uh, there have been other simultaneous multi-slice MRI fingerprinting where some other developments, we won't really get into those today. Uh, this is sort of an extension of parallel imaging and this is, um, completely different, which you don't even make the images. Uh, but then the really next major revolution came uh, just 
within the last five years. So obviously, uh, as you know, deep learning is actually pretty, you know, sort of the revival of deep learning is relatively recent, right? It's only been in the last, say, seven years since the Jeffrey Hinton's group sort of showed that you could do a lot of stuff with deep networks. And so this really caught on very quickly. And so it was in 2018 where sort of the first group, one of the first groups showed that you could actually use deep learning to do, um, um, you know, improve your MRI images. And very quickly, within three to four years, the manufacturers already have products using deep learning. Okay. So this is where we are today. Um, so we're just gonna give you an overview of how we got there and so you have a sense of, of what some of the issues are. Okay. So remember, pretty much what we've done all this up to now is we've talked about, if I have some object, I wanna take its Fourier transform. And this is the data we collect in case space. And we then sort of inverse transform this, right? Now the data are still gonna be collected in case space and MRI, because just that's just how we do it. At least you know, even, even the techniques we've talked about will typically still be case space um, data. But the idea is instead of having to acquire all this data, can we acquire less data? Okay, because the less data we have to acquire, the faster we can go. And also, as you saw in some of your homework, sometimes the data has problems with it, right? There might be some spikes here with the data, right? That introduce artifacts here. Can we be smarter and say, hey, if I see an artifact, it's probably not real. How can I get rid of it? Okay, and so that's where deep learning comes uh, in terms of getting rid of artifacts and also being able to go faster. Um, but to get there, we first want to sort of step back and sort of, sort of look at this expression, which is, you know, in the continuous domain um, and uh, basically showing that this is sort of the 2D4 transform here. And so when we go, what we actually do in real life is we make approximations, right? We're not going to collect Kx continuously. We're going to collect it every delta Kx, let's say. And we're not going to have a voxel everywhere, but we'll have a voxel every delta X, right? So this is my step size and case space. This is my voxel size. And then I'm going to acquire a number of samples. I'll have, say, n voxels, right? I'll have the FOV over the resolution size. And that's how many voxels I have. So if I plug in those approximations into the e to the minus j 2 pi kx, x, then this just turns out to be e to the minus j 2 pi m n over n sub x, okay? Where this is the number of case, but this is indexes case space, this index is image space, and this is the number of voxels I have. Right? So it's just showing that everything becomes sort of just integer value here. And so what I can do is I can sort of approximate these integrals as summation signs, where now I just have these integer value things. And this is essentially what MATLAB does for you. It, it basically computes things at integer values. And I can also do that in 2D. And this is sort of what a sort of 2D, these are the formulas that actually go into the MATLABs like FFT2, okay? Just showing you sort of the connection there. And the reason we wanna do this is obviously, we wanna start talking about how do we solve these things um, in terms of linear algebra. So let's look at sort of, let's say this is my object. Let's, the simplest object possible that's of interest, obviously is a two by two object, right? So, if I want to compute the Fourier transform of that, then I might say, okay, let me take my object, right? And the first thing I want to do is multiply it by something that has no spatial variance, right? So this is obviously at the center of K space. So this would be Kx equals zero, Ky equals zero, okay? And I'm going to sum over both dimensions and therefore that becomes, this is like the center of K space, okay? Now here, this is sort of along this, if we're assuming this is the KY axis, this might be something that varies in the Y direction. So we're gonna take our object and multiply it by something that varies in the vertical dimension, okay? One minus one. And here, this is sort of off along the KX direction. So we're gonna to wanna to take our object and multiply it by something that varies in the X direction. And this Y22 means it's gonna vary diagonally. Okay, so this is essentially the simplest Fourier transform that's interesting that you could do. The key is that even though we think about taking an object and multiplying it by some 2D function, these are just matrices, right? And we could just, as, as you know, in MATLAB, if X is a vector, 
I could always define x colon as the vector equivalent of that, which just takes this column-wise, right? So x colon would equal x11, x21, x12, x22. Okay. So that means that I can vectorize all these things and I can rewrite this whole thing as this is my object. These are these coefficients here. And this is my Fourier coefficients. So the cool thing is now I can write my whole operation as just a matrix multiplication. Okay. And once you can do that, then all the linear algebra opens up to you. Okay. And then that's really this, this view of things in a linear algebraic format is, um, it's not something that was very important maybe 20 years ago, but is, is more important now. And, and probably this course will probably change over the next few years to sort of start from something like this as opposed to Fourier transform. Okay. Any questions up to now? So this is just a picture of what we just did. So let's say this, this is my object, okay? And this is its Fourier transform. So here in this way, I'm saying from this way to here, I take the Fourier transform and then back is the inverse Fourier transform. And so in this case, look at this. I've just taken this and taken it column by column by column. If I do that, I end up with this vector here. Okay, so that's my whole image, but just strung out into a column. Here is my Fourier transform and likewise is strung into a column. And it turns out that this equals this times this big matrix, which we call E, uh, and E is sort of the encoding matrix. Okay. Oops, what's going on here? Okay. Uh, so this is just another view of that. So if I have an NX by NY object, I'm gonna have NX NY terms in my object vector. And then I would NKX NKY terms in my Fourier transform. Then this is NKX NKY terms here. And this encoding matrix, each one of these rows is just that Fourier transform thing. E to the minus J two pi KX X plus KYY. We take each row and multiply by the object, right? And so if I take like this row at kx ky and multiply it by my object, then that's just the Fourier transform at kx ky. Okay, so that's just remember when you multiply matrices, you go row by column and you just work down the rows. All right. So this is the basic idea we have is that we can represent the signal we measure um, as the object time multiplied by some matrix. So for example, we could represent the sinogram in CT like this as well, okay? Because basically, if we represent our object, each one of these would just be the projection on of the object at a certain angle, okay? And then these would be the, 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 the sort of the outputs of your sinogram, okay? Okay, uh, we're not going to go through this. This is this is code that is uh, available on in the module uh, in the supplementary modules for anyone who wants to do this more for their projects. But really, today I'm just going to focus on the high level picture. So we're going to skip over a lot of the math and just give you sort of a sense of what the math means. But we're not really going to delve into too much detail. So let's just remind you. Remember, if you go back to uh, high school and then maybe college. You know, if you have a linear system of equations and the number of equations equals the number of unknowns, then that can be represented with like a square matrix, right? Because the number of um, unknowns is here, right? The number of columns and the number of equations is the number of rows, right? So in this case, if what you hope for is that E is invertible, right? And then you can just take, find the inverse of E and M equals E inverse S, right? And that's where you learned about things like the determinant and all these formulas, right? That you probably are happy to not have to use anymore. Okay. Um, it turns out that E is orthonormal, that if all the columns and rows are sort of orthogonal to each other, okay, sort of they essentially you know, geometrically they're at 90 degree angles to each other, then um, we can just take what's called the 
conjugate the transpose. So that's just a transpose of the matrix and you conjugate the terms. And it turned out that the, um, the inverse is just given by EHS. So this is the term we'll use. And this happens, the Fourier transform has this beautiful property that it's orthonormal or at least orthogonal depending on how we define it. So that each, each frequency component gives you unique information compared to every other unique frequency component. So if you think of the easiest way to think about this, if I, if I take a cosine of one frequency and multiply it by a cosine of another frequency and then integrate that multiplication, that gives me zero, okay? Because those two frequencies are sort of uh, orthogonal in, in signal space. So this is what we've been doing so far, okay? When we talk about aliasing and Nyquist condition, we're trying to get to a square matrix. And if we get to a square matrix, life is good. We can get our data, compute the inverse, and estimate our object. Okay. Uh, the next thing we could do, obviously, is remind you that you could have what's called an overdetermined system, where the number of equations is greater than the number of unknowns, in which case this is what's called a skinny matrix, right? Because it's longer, it's taller than it is wide. And so we're going to talk a little bit about why this comes to play. Okay. So this actually happens in MR. Uh, this is what happens if you have multiple coils looking at the same thing um, and you still want to estimate your object. But by far, the more interesting case for us is the underdetermined case, where you have less equations and, le and then you have unknowns. And this is interesting because you reduce the number of your measurements here, right? You have a lot of unknowns, but you don't have that many measurements. So this is what's called a fat matrix. It's wider than it is tall. And this is what happens. This is what we'd like to do. We want to make this E as short as possible, okay? Because that means we don't have to collect much data. And the problem is, what's your estimate when you do that? You know, what, how do you make this estimate still good? Okay. So that's the undetermined case is where we get all the benefits of going faster um, than uh, the full, fully sampled case, which is here. Okay, so let's just remind us once again, this is in the fully sampled case, then E inverse is just uh, e, e, uh, e to the HS, okay? Now it turns out that depending on how you define these, these terms, for example, in MATLAB, you know, um, e, ideally EHE equals I. So, you know, the norm of each row is one, but um, in the, for example, in MATLAB, the definition has it such that it's equal to nx, nkx, nky times i. But that's okay because you could just take your e um, permission and then divide it by this number. So that's, we're not gonna worry about that, but that's just a detail that, for example, if you look at the MATLAB code, it's got this dividing by this, this term here, okay? But let's look at sort of the, our simple example again. So remember, this is our measured data, right? This is my object. This is my Fourier transform coefficients, and this is just that matrix, right? So even if this was not a minimal imaging class, you could still solve this, right? This is a linear algebra equation, right? And so the solution is just that. I mean, you just plug this in the MATLAB and you'll see that this is the case. Um, and so it means I can solve for my object from my Fourier coefficients, okay? So that's essentially what we're doing. Uh, like in your homework, when you took the big object, you know, you took the Fourier transform and then you took the inverse Fourier transform. You're just doing, MATLAB is just basically doing this for you. Okay. Now, the cool thing is actually you can rewrite this. If you remember some linear algebra, this matrix multiplication is just this thing times this column plus this thing times this column plus this thing times this column plus this thing times that column. That's all that matrix multiplication is. So it means I can take the first Fourier coefficient and multiply by this vector of ones. The second one, which is one minus one, one minus one, and then the next one and the next one. Okay. So it's basically saying I can write my object as a sum of different, essentially, these are my basis functions now, right? And if you remember back to your linear algebra, the idea is if you have a vector space, right? Your image lies in some vector space, okay? So like, for example, if I have an n-dimensional image, 
let's say I have a hundred dimensional image, hundred numbers, then that image, the space of all possible images, let's say I have a hundred dimensional image, X, then X belongs to the space of all possible numbers in a hundred dimensional space, okay? Which is a huge space, right? And that's, that's the problem. We're trying to estimate these things in very high dimensions, right? Here, it's pretty easy. I'm just in a four dimensional space, right? And it's just, and here, obviously, for n dimensional space, you need at least four that many basis vectors that span that space. And so here, these are the four vectors that span that space. And these tend to be the, these have just happen to be the Fourier basis vectors. Uh, now, the cool thing is I can rewrite this in this form. So I can write my original image as this coefficient times one, one, one. And here, obviously, this has no spatial variation. This has spatial variation in the y direction, in the x direction, and the diagonal direction. So this is showing that I can write my image as the sum of these different components. Okay, and these are the four components. Okay, so that's pretty much all the math we're going to do for today. Um, from now, we're just we will show some equations, but we'll just sort of talk you through them. So the first uh, real innovation in MR that happened in the you know, late 90s, early 2000s was going to multiple cores. Okay. Before then, people thought about this, but it's like, well, you know, it's expensive, why do it? You know, what's, what's the killer app? Well, the killer app came in the late 90s, okay, which is you could go faster, much faster. Okay. And so all of a sudden, people started building these coils and figuring out how to build the coils and how to build electronics so you could have lots and lots of channels. So for example, this is a 30 channel head coil. This is the prototype built at Harvard, MIT and MGH. And this is the actual product from Siemens that actually have one of these over at the FMI Center. So here's the idea. If I have a brain here, and let's say in this case, I have eight coils, right? And so I may have coils all around the brain and each coil is small enough such that it only really sees part of the brain, mostly, okay? So if I have a coil here, it's mostly sensitive to the part of the brain that's within the size of this coil, okay? So the smaller I make the coil, the smaller size it's sensitive to. The bigger I make the coil, the more size it's sensitive to. So in this case, if you look at these images here, you can sort of see this coil here is bright here, dark here. This coil makes an image that's bright here, dark here and so on and so forth. Okay. So each of these coils sees something different. And therefore it's giving you, each coil is giving you some spatial information, right? And remember in the Fourier domain, when we do case space, we're trying to figure out what's in the object, right? But the fact that we have different views of the object actually tells us something already about the object. So we should be able to use, make use of this to go faster and not have to collect all of case space. Well, let's just assume that for now, we still do collect all of case space, okay? So we have our object, coil one, we do the full Fourier transform, gives me this vector, okay? Coil two gives me this vector, and coil three. So I basically have three times as much data to deal with, okay? So this is clearly an overdetermined equation, an overdetermined system of equations, right? Got a lot of measurements, but I'm only trying to estimate this many coefficients. So the question is, what's the right answer? What should you do if I gave you these images? So these, each of these images looks fine, right? There's no aliasing. It's a fine looking image. How do you take all these images? And the idea is you want to take all these images and maybe make something that looks nice like that, okay? Like the center image, okay? Um, so it turns out, um, and, and that's sort of just how you would define it mathematically. It turns out that anytime you have an overdetermined system of equations, it's essentially just saying that what I measure is outside of my vector space that I can represent. And this is what I can represent. And I'm just looking for the estimate in my solution space that is, has the smallest error to what I actually measured, okay? Uh, this is what's known as the principle of orthogonality, which um, is incredibly useful. Um, and so it turns out with just that principle, uh, you can, um, Come up with what's called a least squares estimate, which is given by this equation here. Okay. And so we'll take a look at this equation. 
Um, but it's basically, some of you probably have seen this, it's EHE inverse and then EHS, okay? And in the case where EHE is equal to I, in the fully sampled case, uh, or the critically sampled case, then that's equal to I uh, for, for E squared. Um, in which case, then we just go back to MPAT EHS, right? Uh, it turns out that this is probably, uh, if you were gonna pick like one concept to learn in engineering or science, this is probably one of the most bangs for your buck, okay? If you get the principle of orthogonality and you understand least squares equations, it comes up everywhere in engineering, statistics and math, in data science, it's basically, you know, um, something that's super important. Um, and it turns out if I have that, then um, it turns out the answer is actually pretty simple. It turns out if I solve this equation for the fully sample case, and I come up with an approximation for what are called the coil sensitivities, the answer turns out to be take each of these images, just square it, and then add it together. So that's the and then take the square root. So that's the square root of the sum of the squares. Okay, so it turns out that from this linear algebraic thing and some uh, a nice approximation for coil sensitivity, uh, the answer is just, if you have too much data, then reconstruct each coil, square it, add them all together, and then take the square root of the sum of the squares. All right. So that's what people do. And so if you look on an MRI system, you can saw, often see, oh, there's a sum of squares reconstruction. Yeah, and that's what it's doing. Uh, and this is an example of that. So this is what coil one sees. This is what coil two sees. This is my estimate of the coil sensitivity or sort of the sensitivity of each coil. And if I do the sum of squares, I get this image here, which looks pretty good. Okay. But obviously it's gonna turn a little bit on these coil sensitivities. And so let's look at an example of that. So this is some code that's available uh, in the in the module. This is the coil profile. So this is showing one coil that's sort of sensitive here and its sensitivity is falling off. And here's another coil that's more sensitive here, but it's falling off, but they're pretty gentle. They're both seeing a lot of the image, right? And so uh, what it's, and this, this is, this coil sensitivity is going in this dimension here, okay? So if I look at coil one times, and my object is just a, a rectangle. So if I look at coil one times my object, you know, it's falling off very slowly here, and this is falling off very slowly there. Okay. And so if I do um, the reconstruction and I add some noise, I do the, re the actual reconstruction, I get something like this. Okay. So this is if I did the math exactly, right? Now, what I could also do is reconstruct each image on its own and then just take the sum of squares. And if you compare the exact reconstruction to the sum of squares, they're pretty close, okay? So that's why this is what's done in practice because oftentimes we don't have enough information to fully do the actual reconstruction. So we're gonna do the sum of squares pretty much. But this is the key. Let's say our profile is like this, where now coil one sees a lot, but then drops off very fast. Coil two sees a lot here, but then drops off very fast. So in this case, if you look at this, this is the coil one 2D profile. It's very sensitive here, but it's dropping off fast. Coil two is very sensitive here, but it's dropping off pretty fast. Okay. Now coil one sees an object like this, right? It's taking my object and then it's, but it's multiplying it by the coil sensitivity. Coil two sees the opposite. Now, if I know all these things perfectly, then I can always reconstruct my linear equation and if I add some noise, I still get a pretty good looking image, okay? But if I do the sum of squares, I reconstruct each coil and then I take the sum of these squares and square root, you notice that all of a sudden I'm getting some artifacts here, okay? Yes, question. Oh, sorry, P, P, inverse, uh, P inverse stands for pseudo inverse. Uh, it's just the MATLAB function that actually calculates the least squares estimate for you. So if you take the pseudo, basically in this case, it's equal to EH, E, 
inverse e h times s. Okay, it's basically if you if you actually type help p inverse in MATLAB, it's just it's just that function. Yeah, and if actually if you look at the code that's online in the supplementary module, you'll see we use that exact function. Okay, so. Um, this is saying that, okay, sum of squares actually works pretty well when the coils profiles are fairly similar, but doesn't work so well when they're quite different. Okay. So, um, so that's a limitation. So when, so initially when people said, well, we want to do sum of squares acquisitions, they tried to make coils that each were pretty big. And so each saw a lot of the object. And that was the right solution if you want to do sum of squares. But it turns out that's a completely the wrong solution if you want to go faster. Okay, so we're going to see that 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 what works really well for one problem is actually the wrong solution for another problem. Okay. So um, so and that's and the the problem that we want to talk about. I think this just died. Let me. You guys can hear me without this, right? Okay. So I'm just going to take this off. All right. So what we want to do is we want to look at the undetermined system of equations. So remember, this is our full square matrix, right? This is where we have all the data we need and we can go back and forth between these pretty easily. The next case is what do we undersample? Okay. We don't, we, in this case, we've cut the number of measurements in half. And you actually did this for your homework, right? Where you just got rid of every other line. Right. So that's essentially doing the same thing. I'm just getting rid of every other row in this encoding matrix. So now I definitely have an undersampled case, right? I've got more unknowns than I have equations, right? It turns out that the estimate that you get is what's called the minimum norm estimate, which is M hat is going to be given by this expression here, which is the same as if you took this full matrix and multiply it by something that where you filled in zeros everywhere that you didn't have data, which is exactly what you did in your homework. Okay. So it turns out the, the best solution you can come up with it, what's called the minimum norm solution, is that which um, anywhere you don't have data, you just assume the data is zero. Okay. Now you could assume something else, but the minimum norm solution is that where you just assume it's zero. Um, so basically that's equivalent to saying that the missing Fourier components, the ones you didn't measure, they lie in the null space of your, this encoding matrix, which means that this encoding matrix times anything in that null space M hat is equal to zero. Okay. Um, so that null space is a, a concept from linear algebra. And let me just, not, we don't you know, have time to go through all linear algebra. Let me just tell you what it means. It means that this is one solution that's possible, okay? And all these other solutions, m hat, lie along the null space. That means that if I had that, if I add that to my solution and I multiply by my encoding matrix, it gives me zero. So I never see it, okay? So it means this possible solution plus all these other things that are in the null space give me all these solutions, right? This is a solution. This solution, this is a solution, this is a solution, right? So that's, remember, if you go to undetermined systems, you have many, many solutions, right? So the question is, which solution should you pick? Or you, you have an infinite number of solutions, right? I just drawn five of them here. So the minimum norm solution is just pick the solution that's the smallest, which is this one, okay? And that means that anything along the null space, you should just zero out. So that actually turned out to be the solution. So the minimum norm solution is all the solutions pick the one with the smallest length, and um, that's and that's the solution that gives you aliasing. Okay, so let me see. I think I that was so that's the minimum norm solution is this alias solution. Okay, so it's just taking a different view. Different previously in your homework you did this and you did the inverse Fourier transform. It's like oh there's aliasing. We talked about aliasing, right? Now we're just presenting you a different view. We're saying this is actually what happens. If you take solve this system and just pick the solution that has all those components zeroed out. Okay, so the question is, why do we undersample? Like, what's what's the benefit, right? So, the main thing is it reduces the time and the cost of acquisition. Okay. 
Reducing time, as we talked about before, can be the difference between making an exam and not making an exam, right? For example, if you're trying to image a baby that's moving, if you can cut the exam time down from an hour to 10 minutes, that's like the difference between doing the exam and not doing the exam, okay? Reducing time, uh, you know, an hour on an MRI scanner might cost you a thousand or two thousand dollars. Okay. So from the point of view of the hospital administrators, they're like, but actually, but you can bill for each patient individually, right? So if you can do a patient in 15 minutes, that means you can do four patients an hour versus if you it takes an hour per patient, that's one patient per hour. So you can make, you know, two to four times as much money in an hour if you can go faster. So that's the other, that's sort of, there's both the economic incentive and the clinical incentive, okay? Um, so there's really two main approaches that we're going to talk about for dealing with undetermined systems. One is we're going to use additional information to make the system of equations well posed, okay? And that's parallel imaging. That's saying, take my undetermined system and get more measurements. So we go from underdetermined to overdetermined. And then we're gonna see what the solution is. The other approach is, is actually, and so I would say this is sort of the next phase of MR, but then really the sort of the, the sort of the, the modern phase I would call is where we actually use prior information and assumptions. Okay. So this is sort of engineering and this becomes engineering and math and statistics where basically now we're gonna say, when I image a human being, I don't expect to like see a picture of like a Pokemon character, right? I sort of have a pretty good prior on what a human brain should look like, okay? So that's actually not something we've talked about yet. We've assumed, you know, the four, eight, the Nyquist conditions are assuming the object could be anything. And therefore we've had, we've limited ourselves to acquiring all this data. Okay, so let's look, take a little look at what, how we could speed up things. So let's say I satisfy the Nyquist condition, right? And I acquire all my lines in case space and I get this nice looking image. Okay. One way we could save time is we could say, well, we'll just collect the center of case space, right? I can go twice as fast if I only collect the center, but what's the problem? Well, I don't get these high frequency components. So I'm gonna end up with a blurrier image. This might be okay in certain circumstances, but wouldn't it be nice to not have to give that, that resolution? The other approach you could do is, well, let's just skip every other line. That will let me go faster, but this gives me aliasing. Okay. It turns out the novel insight was, I can make this aliasing going, go away if I just get more channels. Uh, so basically, um, this is just saying that um, when we talk about this, so this is just showing us we're going to get multiple channels. We're mostly going to be talking about things in the phase encode direction because that's the slower direction. Okay. But this applies in 2D as well. But just uh, that's what we're going to be talking about. So here's the, here's the basic concept. I go from under sample where I just have one coil, and this is clearly underdetermined. And now I add just more coils. All right. So I've gone from under sample and underdetermined to overdetermined. Okay, so that's the trick. That's why you're, from a linear algebra point of view, you're just getting more data. Okay, so now you can actually make this a well posed problem. Um, so, for example, in this case, let's say acceleration factor is typically how many lines of case space you skip. So, R equals two means I'm going to skip every other line of case space. Okay. And, but I'm skipping lines in case space, but I'm making up for it by getting multiple coil information. Okay, so that's the transformation. This here is undersampled, but now when I add the information from all these coils, I can make it uh, overdetermined. Okay. The drawback is the system of equations you come up with is really big. So let's say you have like a 200 by 200 image that's already, uh, what is that? Um, 200, it's like four times 10 to the four, 40,000, is that 40,000? Is that right? Yeah, 40,000, right? So 40,000, 40,000 by 40,000, right? So that's a really big matrix, right? 
And then you've got multiple coils. So let's say you have 32 coils. You have 40,000 by 40,000, and then you have to multiply that by 32. So you end up with these huge matrices. And so it turned out that you can't actually solve it with just doing, you can't just put it into MATLAB. I mean, you can do it. The problems you have in this supplementary module are very small matrices, and so that works. But for anything big, it, it's not going to work. And so therefore, the main um, advance was um, coming up with these approaches of efficiently solving this equation. Okay, and they have names like sense, grappa, and spirit. So we're mostly going to talk about sense and then grappa, and um, and I think that's what we'll do for today. Okay. So here's the idea behind sense. So sense was the first one that came out and it's still pretty widely used, although it's probably um, losing ground a little bit to some other approaches. But here's the idea. Let's say this is my object here, okay? And I have two voxels, A and B. And each of those voxels, if this is a coil here, they're weighted by the sensitivity of this coil. So this voxel here, when I measure it, will have IA times CA, and this will be IB times CB. Okay. So I have a full Fourier, no problem, right? I get a nice image, there's no aliasing. Right? But let's say I sort of understand by two, such that I get Nyquist, my replicas repeat, right? In which case, let's assume that this ends up right on top of this guy, okay? A and B are aliased, right? So they land up right on top of each other. So if I only have one image, there's nothing I can do. I, I have like, I, if I give you a sum, you can't tell me anything about what went into the sum, right? If I say, my sum is 10, I mean, you have to say, well, what are the two numbers that went into the sum? You, you can't really tell, right? But if I give you additional measurements, you would be able to tell. So for example, here, this coil, I've got IA plus IB multiplied why they coil sensitivities of coil one, CA1 and CB1. So that's one of you, okay. Now I go to this coil, the IA and the IB are the same because the image, the underlying image is the same. But now look, I'm multiplying those numbers by different coil sensitivities, right? So every coil, it's like you're looking at these two things, but the sum is made up with different coefficients, okay? So I'm getting the multiple views of the same sum but that sum is made up of different coefficients. And that's shown here. Basically, these are my four sums that I get to see. These are what I'm trying to solve for. And these are the coefficients that go into the sum. So look, this looks like something you could solve, right? It's an overdetermined system of equations. And therefore, I should be able to solve for i and ib. And it turns out that's actually the case. And this is the idea behind sense. Okay. So this is sensory. And this is from 1999. All right, so what is that, 23 years ago? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this was a big deal when it came out. Okay. And it's still used clinically pretty much every day. Uh, I'm not going to really go through this, just it's just showing that if you actually go through all the math and work through it. There's a lot of pretty gnarly math. You come up with exactly the same thing we just talked about, which was this, that you get these different sums and you can estimate your magnetization just by knowing these coil coefficients. Okay. But now we wanna answer the question. So, so when people first came up with that, that was cool. It's like, this is amazing. We can actually go faster now, right? And we can reconstruct our image. But then the question came up, if you were a coil designer, how should you make these coil profiles? Like what's the optimum coil profile? Previously we saw for sum of squares, you want those co coil profiles to be fairly overlapping, right? When they became non-overlapping, then sum of squares didn't look so good. It turned out the answer for sense and parallel imaging is actually the opposite. If they're too much overlapping, you're gonna get really crappy images. And so you wanna make them as diverse as possible, which makes sense because you're trying to have each coil have enough different coefficients such as a different enough from every other coil, okay? Uh, so I'm not gonna really go through this except to say that um, we can introduce um, the RM hat um, depends on sort of 
um, we can write it uh, mathematically uh, as sort of something where the coil coefficients come into play. Okay. And so we can define the SNR that we would get if we had all the data and divide it by the SNR we get when we're trying to accelerate the data. And it turns out there's something, and the main point I want to get across today is uh, in MRI, if you look at, if you buy a system or you talk about a system, there's always going to be something called the G factor. Okay? And the G factor tells you um, something about how much noise is amplified because the coils are not optimal or your settings are not optimal. So let's take a look example. I just want to get across the point of this. These are three different images of the same brain. Okay, and clearly it's getting better as I go from left to right, right? This is really noisy, right? And you're sort of seeing some weird artifacts here. And this is actually a lot better, okay? And all they did here was they took two coils and at first they had them overlapping um, uh, quite a bit. So this was two coils spaced one centimeter apart and they move them three centimeters apart and then six centimeters apart. So they basically just move these coils away from each other and reconstruct the image. This is what's called the G factor. This is how much the noise is being amplified in different parts of the image. So here you see the G factor is pretty close to one. So there's really everywhere you go, the noise is not too amplified. But here you look at here, here the G factors are quite strong. And so you sort of see these big noise areas, okay? So let's go back and look at our example. Um, we can skip these. This is for the coil profile we looked at before. Okay. And now we're going to undersample. And so now when we reconstruct the image from each coil, we end up with these aliased images. Okay. And if we do the estimated recon, actually we can get rid of that aliasing. So the sense recon magically takes, these are sort of, if you did individual recon, you get this. But if you combine the data correctly, you get a nice estimate of your image. Okay. This is the G factor. You can see it's pretty close to one. It means anywhere you go, the noise is really not that amplified. Okay. So ideally you want G factor to be pretty close to one. Okay. Now let's look at this coil profile here. Here we have the overlapping coil profiles, right? This turned out to be really good for some of squares. And if you look at each coil recon, it's basically an aliased image of my original object, but they look pretty similar. And look at here, this is my estimated image. It's horrible. Okay. And this is the G factor. And look at the factor here. It's like 18, way greater than one. So this is where G factor comes in. So when people are designing these coils, this becomes one of the most important things is they want to design the coils such that the coils don't overlap so much because if each coil sees the same thing, then you can't really undo that sum process. You have to have enough coil diversity such that the, the coils see enough different views of the object such that you can undo that summation. Okay. Uh, so the main thing is, uh, so the main thing is we can go faster if we have more coils, but we need to make sure those coils have the right amount of overlap. All right. Um, this is just plotting the G factor once again here. For these coils, you can sort of see it's fairly close to one everywhere, All right? This is 1.06 to 1.2. Here, it's basically around 18. Okay. okay, so that's sense. Now, the other approach that's very popular these days is called GRAPA. Uh, has any, does anyone know what GRAPA stands for? Supposedly it's a name of a wine or some some alcoholic drink in, in Europe. So um, so a lot of uh, a lot of MRI acronyms are try to people try to be cute. So Grappa is, is I think it's like vodka like maybe maybe like that. Okay. Um, so um, here's the idea. And once again, even though we're going beyond Fourier, we're still going to use Fourier concepts. If I have an object and I look at it with some coil, then I get this image, right? So 
this obviously is not my full image because I've only seen it through some small coil that only sees part of my object. What does that mean? That means if I take the Fourier transform of that object, this is Fourier transform, I multiplied here, so I'm gonna convolve here. So that's con convolving with the Fourier transform of this, which is maybe some blurring function like this. So this guy gets blurred out by this guy. So it's for a transform is now blurred. Okay. But what does that mean? That means that if I have a point in case space here and there's blurring, it means it's sort of related to all the other points in case space, right? It's not independent because I took this thing where things are fairly independent, I sort of smeared it all out. So now different parts of case space are related to each other. And it turns out that you can actually make use of that to say, okay, everything I didn't acquire, let me just estimate it, okay? I didn't acquire the data, but I know K space is pretty blurry. So by taking the surrounding point, I should be able to estimate what I didn't acquire. Okay. And that's exactly the idea behind Grappa. Essentially, here's what I acquired and the zero the empty circles are what I didn't acquire. So let me do a calibration scan where maybe I'll acquire some data in the middle and figure out what are the weights I need to go from the collected data to estimate each uncollected data, okay? And so I can go from something where I'm missing data and I can, re for every coil, I can reconstruct its full Fourier transform. And then I can just inverse transform each coil and then do my sum of squares. Okay, so it's sort of a different approach to the problem. And that's exactly what's done. So basically, Grappa is saying, this is what I have. I've got these coils, right? They're undersampled. But instead of solving, this is the sense equation, right? Sense is saying, let's just brute force solve this head on and come up and it comes up with a very nice solution. Grappa's like, well, you know, maybe what we could do is make each of these, the grappa is going to take this undersample data and just make my measurements more. So I'm gonna fill in the data where I didn't have the data. So now I can use the full coefficients. And this is my overdetermined equation I had before where the solution to this was just sum of squares. Okay, so that's what grappa does. And so this is some examples of grappa where basically here you can see we've accelerated by two, three and four. In this case, you can sort of see there is obviously artifacts coming in here at acceleration of four, um, but at R of two, it's pretty good, right? This looks like a pretty good image. R of three, you're starting to see some amplification. So this implies that for this coil, the G factor is such that you're getting noisy amplification in these regions. Okay. So you'd have to go back and either change something about your acquisition or change your coil. Okay, so I think, yeah, so let's just do two more slides and then we'll, we'll transition into some, um, let's see. Okay, we'll just probably give you a sense of where we're going. So what we've done so far is basically just given you a sense of what happened in the late 90s all through the 2000s, okay? So from 2000 to 2010, that was really the era of parallel imaging, okay? So if you were, had been taking this course like 10 or 15 years ago, that would have been state of the art, right? And so the idea was we could either um, do sense recon or we could do grab recon. And either case, you, get a, you end up with something that allows you to go faster. And typically, clinically, this allows you to go two or three times faster is typically what people will end up doing. If you really want to push the limits, like in some of our acquisitions, we might go eight times as fast. Okay, but that requires a lot of engineering to get it to work. Okay, but that's considerable. I mean, going eight times as fast is huge, right? Um, but here's the problem. We're actually leaving a lot on the table, right? Because we're trying to solve for every possible image, okay? If you think about like a 16-bit image, right? Uh, that means that, you know, every voxel can be, you know, have two to the 16 values, right? And so if I have 
um, that means that there's a 1 billion possible 120 by 100 height images, okay? Or 17 billion possible 512 by 512 images. Or if I say I want a 32 bit image, right? I really want a very high resolution image. Now, in general, you don't need that, but you know, um, then that's 70 trillion possible images or one quintillion 512 by 512 images. So that's a huge space of possible images that we're trying to solve for. So those images include images like this, right? These are all possible images, right? But these all look like images that have artifacts, right? And this image also includes like, this is a possible image or this is a possible image. I mean, there's all, anything I could draw is a possible image, right? But the space of biological structures and specifically human anatomy without artifacts is actually quite small. So if we can come up with a recon that says, hey, I don't need to solve this whole space. I just need to find the images that are in this space. Then we should be able to make images much better and much faster. Okay. So the first step of this is compressed sensing, but then really the major quantum leap is going to come with deep learning. Okay. So remember what we've talked about so far: fully sampled Fourier reconstruction, including parallel imaging, tries to solve this entire problem. Okay, so it's actually trying to do too much. Okay. What we want to do is try to just solve in this space. And so compressed sensing is really was the first attempt to do that. Okay? So here's the idea. Uh, and some of I know there's a few projects on this. So this is just a very high level overview. This is our favorite Shep Logan phantom that some of you played with in CT. Uh, this is its Fourier transform. Now I'm just going to randomly throw out a bunch of data. So I'm only keeping some of the data. And so this is the, the points I've kept. Okay. So this doesn't seem like it satisfies any Nyquist condition, right? It, and it's sort of random, right? So how would you do anything with this? So if I do a typical reconstruction where I don't make any assumptions about my data or what my image looks like, I get something really terrible, right? This is, if I just did a sort of a standard, like minimum norm estimate that we just talked about, this is what the data looks like, okay? But if I say, you know, I'm going to put some other constraints on my image. In this case, total variation, which means the image can't, the, the, the sort of from voxel to voxel, you can't vary it too much, okay? Then all of a sudden actually get quite a nice looking image, right? Almost indistinguishable from the original image. And that's the hope of compressed sensing that I'm bringing additional information about images have certain features. So if I impose those features on my images, I should be able to go faster. Um, so that's really what it's doing. It's basically saying, I want to minimize some cost function of my image, my estimate, subject to the fact that um, what I measure and my estimate going through this encoding matrix is a small error, okay? So that's called data consistency. Um, so let's pick up on this next time um, and we'll start deep learning next time. Um, but that's where we're headed, where we're going to pose additional constraints on our image such that we can make better images. Okay. Uh, so any questions before we sort of talk, move into sort of logistics parts of the lecture? Okay, so first of all, I'm going to try to make this viewable, project one viewable. So how do I do that? Post grades, okay, there we go. Let's see if that worked. Everyone will be able to see their grades. Okay. Okay, so project one grades are now posted, so they should be all viewable. And what I'm gonna do is just spend a few minutes talking a little bit about um, some things we saw on project one uh, and hopefully um, this might be helpful as you're coming up with your project too. Okay. Uh, so the mean score was 90, uh, standard deviation of four. And so you can sort of see that was also the mode was close to 90 as well. So, you know, quite a lot of the groups scored sort of in this middle range. 
And so let's talk a little bit about what it took to go this way or this way. Okay. So going this way, typically the main distinguishing factor was these groups just did more difficult things. Okay, they did either lots of simulations that were fairly creative or they, they basically just did more stuff that was not easy to do. Okay, so that's sort of the difficulty part. Okay, so for example, uh, if you just did a fairly standard MATLAB simulation, this you'd be in this thing. And if you did something that was a little more difficult, then you would have ended up here. Okay. Now, here to move down from here to here, you had to sort of both do something that was not very difficult, okay, which means you either didn't do any simulation at all, or you did something that was fairly like, you know, not much beyond sort of, uh, you know, what maybe some of the template um, codes that you were given were, or there was minimal connection to course content. Um, and that we talked about a little bit before, which is that if someone could listen to your talk without knowing anything about Fourier transforms or whatever, or slice project, you know, what, you know, how MF implementing works, if it had, could it easily just been a, um, a talk about, you know, uh, segmenting images with cats, then it's not really a strong text and course content. So I think this for this round, project two, I, I don't think, I think most groups are, should be fine on that. I think because, you know, I've sort of looked at every project. Um, I, I think you're all fine on that. And so I, I really, you know, and, and certainly professor, and the way these are graded is Professor McVeigh and I sort of grade independently and then we compare scores. And some years we differed a lot, but this year we were sort of almost, the correlation was very high, okay? And so uh, my hope is that for project two, that you know everyone will be up here. Okay, there's no reason why everyone can't be up here. I think everyone's got some good projects and, and where I've given you feedback, if you've get, gotten feedback, just take that into consideration where I've said, you know, not this is okay, but you know, maybe you wanna think a little more about the difficulty than just you know, to move from here to here, you would just wanna sort of take that into account. Okay, so any questions uh, 